So welcome everyone to our program, An Evening with Kathy Park Hong, author of Minor Feelings and Asian American Reckoning. This program is brought to you by 21 Chicago area libraries. I'm Roz Topolsky with the Vernon Area Public Library, and I'm joined by my colleague, Sam Adams Lanham from the Barrington Area Library. And we are thrilled to have such strong interest in this program, both from the libraries and from our readers. We're using the webinar version of Zoom this evening, so um, you can put your questions for Kathy into the Q&A. We'll take questions at the conclusion of the program, but please put your questions in the Q&A as we think of them. If you have technical questions, then please put them in the chat and we'll, be, we'll help you from there. Tonight's program is being recorded, so you'll receive a link with the recording by early next week, and you can feel free to share it with other people that you think would be interested in hearing this conversation. We are very grateful for the support of several local independent booksellers, and I will put a link um, with their uh, information in the chat once we get started. And at the end of the evening, you'll see a survey on your screen, and we hope that you'll just take a minute to, to, to fill it out and so that we can have your feedback. So now I'd like to introduce you to our two guests for tonight. Um, first, we have Monica Eng. Uh, Monica is a Chicago reporter for Axios. Um, for more than three decades, Monica has, has covered Chicago food, culture, policy, history, health, and the environment. She has reported for the Chicago Sun-Times, Chicago Tribune, and most recently, WBEZ Public Radio. And Kathy, um, Kathy Park Hong is the New York Times bestselling author of Minor Feelings and Asian American Reckoning. Minor Feelings was a Pulitzer Prize finalist won the National Book Critics Circle Award for Autobiography, and caught the attention of Time Magazine and earned Kathy a spot on this year's Time's 100 Most Influential People list. Um, Kathy's prose and poetry have been published in the New York Times, The New Republic, The Guardian, and Paris Review, among others. She is the poetry editor of The New Republic and is a full professor at Rutgers Newark University. Minor Feelings received fantastic reviews as soon as it was published. And I'm just going to share two reviews with you now to give you a sense about the impact of the book. Um, according to NPR, Minor Feelings is a major reckoning, pulling no punches as the author uses her life's flashpoints to give voice to a wider Asian American experience, one with cascading consequences. And according to Time Magazine, Kathy Park Hong's voice is urgent and raw as she unpacks what it's like to experience prejudice that doesn't fit into the exact mold of oppression faced by other minorities in the US. Hong is brutally self-aware and embraces her anger as she captures how she struggled to make sense of her identity. So um, Monica and Kathy, welcome to our webinar. We are just really delighted to have you both with us tonight. And I'm gonna turn things over to you now. Well, thanks everyone for coming out tonight virtually um, uh, to, to hear this, what I think is gonna be a really exciting discussion with Kathy and um, me. I'll just be asking the questions and uh, um, channeling some of your questions. Um, I know, I really hope that everyone has a book like this with lots of post-it notes and lots of questions and lots of annotation um, because it's, it's such a fascinating book bringing up so many Interesting points. I think one person who talked to Kathy said she puts into words things that we sort of felt but just didn't know how to say. Um, and um, so without further ado, Kathy, just for, for those who maybe haven't dug into your biography or the book yet, what are some important things to know about you to understand where you're coming from and to understand this book? I think you're still on mute. God, I keep doing that. It's such a <laughs> rookie mistake, and yet I keep doing it. Um, I, um, the, whew, I, I guess that, you know, I, a lot of my, I guess a, a lot of my biography is in the book, but it's not, you know, it's not necessarily a memoir. It's a strange hybrid of, uh, memoir, cultural criticism, history, you know, it's both uh, supposed to be, uh, you know, it's um, in one of my 
essay, as I say, that to write about race is both a polemic and a lyric. And that is sort of what minor feelings is, is that it's both it's both a lyric um, and a polemic. And so going off of that, I, I will say that um, I'm it's a very subjective perspective of of my, um, of being Asian American in America. Um, and I am, and the perspective that I'm going at it from is um, I'm a poet, you know, I'm a poet. I'm, I grew up in the, I grew up in LA. I was born and raised in LA. Um, you know, I guess you could call me a Gen Xer. Um, maybe I'm a little bit, no, I'm pretty much a Gen Xer. And, you know, and, um, uh, during, so that was like grew up in LA during the eighties and nineties and, um, second generation Korean American, um, uh, you know, was bad at math, you know, was really into, um, always wanted to be in the arts since, you know, I could, uh, lift up a pencil or a pen or something. So I think that it's very important to note that, um, you know, I, this book is not at all uh, representative or is somehow supposed to be a, a definitive com, um, compendium on Asian American history. It's very much a strange, subjective uh, uh, perspective on, on being Asian. And a lot of that has to do, the book has a lot to do with, uh, you know, in a certain way, it's like a portrait of uh, an Asian American poet, which is what I am. So a lot of it was also kind of leaning towards um, um, sort of my coming of age as a creative person and um, um, dealing with some of the exclusionary practices uh, in American letters and stuff. So that's, I could start from there. I mean, I hope, I, I don't know if that's, uh, we could talk more about it's, who it's I am helpful. as we continue our conversation. <laughs> no, I, I think it's super helpful. I think it's helpful to the audience. Um, again, if you haven't already read it, read it, but um, but I think it, that's it's a good launching point. I'm so glad you said bad at math because, and mm -hmm. we can get into the whole stereotypes about Asians, um, but whenever I would go to the Asian American Journalism Association conference, there'd always be some jokester who gets up at the podium. I, I think we all know why we're all here today. And they'd say, because we didn't get into the engineering school or the law school or the medical mm -hmm. school or we're bad at math, so we're all journalists. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we become writers. But I think I think you, you get to the point, the whole model minority, um, that is certain that the Asian Americans are a certain type of person because that's so much of, of who we were told we were, who our parents told us we were, and uh, what society told us we were. And, and I totally want to get into that, but I didn't want to um, to miss uh, the, the sort of this really fascinating question. I thought it's, it's that I heard that you were thinking about, you know, doing this in verse as, 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 a, as a poem at one point, and you, then you were like, no, this has got to be nonfiction, which wasn't um, your your medium of choice that much. How did that work? Uh, you know, first of all, I do, I mean, I've had experience with prose, you know, actually um, right after I graduated from college, I was also, I did dabble in journalism. I was, I used to, I was uh, a fact checker and I wrote for the Village Voice. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, and it was a really, uh, that was, you know, when the paper was, actually regarded as important. And it was uh, covering a lot of, uh, you know, it was during um, Giuliani's tenure in New York City and when he was a mayor. Before and, he went mad? Huh? Before he went mad? He was mad that back then. <laughs> <laughs> we just, New Yorkers just knew what <laughs> we were, Before what yeah. the rest of America was getting into. But, uh, you know, and so he, the newspaper, you know, so the newspaper was covering the police brutality, uh, uh, you know, the killing of Diallo and, and so forth back then. So, you know, I've had, ex I had experience with journalism before I pursued poetry, before I went to grad school for poetry. Um, I have also written um, uh, book reviews, I've written criticism and so forth. So I wasn't entirely new to prose. Um, 
but my primary um, uh, mode of expression was poetry. I've had, I could, I, I wrote three collections of poems and, um, you know, I was teaching poetry and at some point, and I was also always interested in writing. I always, uh, all of my poetry dealt with race or immigration or, um, you know, colonialism in one sense or another, but then I was like, I, wanted to challenge me. I always like to challenge myself by, you know, I always love to make my life more dis- difficult that way. And um, I realized that I never was, I was afraid, I realized I was afraid of writing autobiographically. And, and so um, I tried to do that with poetry. I was like, okay, I'm going to really write personally about race as it applies to my life or how I grew up. And um, I wanted to do it both sincerely, but also satirically. And it just wasn't coming through via poetry. I think like whenever I tried to write satirically via poetry, um, you know, I had a few poems published, uh, a few of those poems published, people, readers were taking it seriously. And I just, you know, I, I realized I needed more room to spread out. Like I needed to really kind of, um, I needed to write in sentences to do that. And um, and also I realized that poetry wasn't the right medium to make an argument. And I was, make I wanted to make an argument. I wanted to, the more I was thinking about this, the more I realized I wanted to kind of, uh, stage an intervention and set the record straight, act as a kind of write a corrective against all of the kind of falsities that I grew up with uh, about being Korean, being Asian, being a woman of color, all of that, you know, and just like, I just wanted to kind of clear the bullshit, you know, and so that's why I wrote uh, Minor Feelings. And it's also much more accessible than um, my poetry because I just wanted to kind of just again for that reason i just wanted to clear the air you know and i just wanted to kind of not only explain to people the audience but explain to myself um, ask myself these questions of um um what what the asian american condition is is there an asian american consciousness you know how does asian american being asian american um, fit into this kind of racial capitalist history of uh, of the U.S. and you know all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned Asian American, and you know when you go to the Asian American Journals and Association, uh, you you get uh, conferences. You get a lot of people talking about yes, there are similarities, but we are not a monolith, and there are tons mm-hmm. of differences. And you know there was even a session: is Asian American a useful term anymore? Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel about that? I, I think it's just you get we get we tend to get caught up in this like sort of Ouroboros of like qualifications like you know before you say anything about Asia being Asian American um, you know before you say anything about uh, being Asian American you have to kind of list a litany of um, how you're not speaking for any all Asian Americans and you're only speaking from this kind of demographic and you're not speaking for that kind of demographic and so forth and after a while it gets a little tiresome and I I, I don't know I think a lot of the disparateness that we're talking about can also apply to um, most minorities, you know, you could say the same thing with Latinos, right? Except e- even with Latinos, I mean, they have a shared language, but then there's also um, racial uh, disparities among La- Latinos, much more so than Asian Americans. So uh, these problems are uh, applicable to all uh, different races, I guess, um, even Black Americans, you know, because, you know, are we talking about um you know in a way no because it's of course it's uh, black americans are very different from asian americans because of their his the history of slavery and um dispossession segregation mass incarceration and 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 so forth but at the same time um the black diaspora is also quite varied you know um 
I would say I, you know, but I sort of see Asian Americans, you don't have, you can see them as variegated and having, you know, common sensibilities at the same time. Like, um, you know, um, Guattari once said, uh, you know, called a, um, something as a plurality, a plurality of disparate groups coming together in a kind of unified dis disunity, a pragmatic solidarity without solidity. And I think that's sort of a nice way of like kind of, um, you know, kind of describing the kind of commonalities and some contradictions of being Asian American, that there's a kind of, we have, you can have a unified dis disunity and also, you know, I sort of see Asian American, you know, back to its original term, you know, which is when it was uh, coined in 1968 by these Asia, uh, UC Berkeley Asian American activists, you know, um, where they didn't see it as a, a prescriptive label. What they saw it is, they saw it more as something that was, um, a term that had it was more um aspirational you know it were um in not aspirational in a capitalist sense but like aspirational as in um they saw asian american as um a a, a a, an oppositional group, an oppositional identity, the, kind of like the way a lot of LGBTQ groups, uh, groups sees queer as an oppositional identity. It's like you're kind of, you're, it's a it's a term that's um, resisting whatever um, 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 hegemons that are working against them. And that way you don't have to think, you don't have to see Asian American as this kind of binding label but as, um, you know, as a sensibility uh, that's resistant. Thanks. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons, um, I guess this was originally booked was um, some of the organizers had been looking at the, the hate crimes against Asian Americans in the last year. And that, that certainly was, was after you'd written this, um, what, mm -hmm. What what were you thinking when you saw? I mean, obviously there were hate crimes before, and there unfortunately will be after. But the 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 big spate of them at that time, how did how did that strike you at the time? I was definitely. Um, I, I mean, I was uh, upset. I guess. I mean, and it's still happening. It hasn't gone away, you know. And it, I mean, it's just. I mean, this is the problem with um, media is that they. You know they 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 treat uh, these like you focus in at one time and these, then yeah these hate incidents as like happening during one year and then it just disappears but it doesn't disappear it's just the cameras have turned elsewhere um, um, just tonight there was a, a woman who was uh, beaten up in the subway you know and um, uh, and she was an East Asian woman I. I, you know, I, I found it very, uh, it, it was very upsetting. I mean, yes, the book came out beforehand. Um, I was, um, you know, very, uh, uh, it, it was, I wouldn't say I was upset, angry, um, maybe confused. I wouldn't say I was necessarily surprised uh, because this has happened. I mean, this kind of, uh, um, hate or discrimination or just um, the way Asian Americans are treated in America was uh, something that I was exposed to when I was a kid, right? Or that I saw happening to my parents and I wrote about it in the book. Like I write about how, uh, you know, my grandmother, for instance, was, uh, um, you know, kicked to the ground by some white kids, you know? And, um, or I've seen where I talked about how my parents were disrespected by white adults. And um, um, so it was, and that was the most painful part of growing up was not even my own, the um, kind of, and these are not microaggressions, by the way, you know, they were not, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't like, um, you know, people, kids taunting me in the recess, or it wasn't, you know, it wasn't even like kids taunting me about, what I brought for lunch, you know, it was, it was much more hurtful than that. It was like seeing my parents or my grandmother just absolutely humiliated, you know, 
Um, and so when the, when it was happening, but I think like what happens as you grow older, I think if you're anyone who's someone of color, if you're able to do it, if you have the privilege to do it, is to kind of leave the premises in which of in which you were exposed to that. So it's like if you grew up in a small town or like, you know, or uh, where there was no one like you, you know, I moved to, I mean, I grew up in LA, but like, you know, I, you know, I'm in, I'm in another, I'm in New York city, moving to New York city and finding um, like-minded people and finding a community and so forth. So I think for a little while I was, sh I shielded myself from that. Um, and then when I saw that happening again, it was, it did, remind me, you know, especially when, um, um, you know, the elderly were being attacked, that um, this has always happened. But now there was more permission, I guess, to happen for it to happen in public. But, you know, racism is never new, it just comes in new forms, you know, it's just it just gets reproduced in different ways throughout history. So this anti-Asian hate has, or discrimination, whatever you want to call it, has always um, been around since Asians first started coming here. And, um, and maybe it's subsided a little bit. We don't know for sure. Um, probably not, but it'll come back, you know. Um, uh, what I found really um, galvanizing, though, is how... Uh, um, so many Asian Americans, younger Asian Americans are galvanized. And, um, you know, I think we're still seeing um, what's going to happen. We're still seeing, we're going to see what's going to happen uh, with Asian Americans and what, how that's going to, um, how they're going to be politicized. I think it's a little too early to tell, but I was also very buoyed by the fact that Michelle Wu, for instance, won mayor for Boston. And I thought, I think she's a great, representative of of a new form a new kind of asian american politician one who is um for restorative justice and the green new deal and for workers rights and i'm like you know and i think that you know um it's definitely mobilized a lot of a lot of people a lot of asians in um in a way that's also that complicates the identity and that also uh looks deeper into allyship yeah, um, I was I was so thrilled to see it. She's a Chicago girl from Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> and then raised in the suburbs, but uh, making good in Boston. We also have Teresa Ma, who's our state representative here. Um, so slowly but surely, you are seeing um, East Asian women, uh, especially, get into politics. Um, my, my grandfather came here 100 years ago. So one side of my family went into restaurants. The other was... Um, went into grocery stores in the South. And the reason why they went into grocery stores in the deep South was because whites would not sell to African-Americans. And so the Chinese became the intermediaries. They opened all the groceries. And, uh, but they, uh, they still couldn't go, like my great aunts couldn't go to school there. Um, they had separate schools for colored mm -hmm. you know, Chinese. And so, Asians have long occupied this weird limbo space that you you write about. Can you talk more about that and how that plays out in in interactions, in our own view of ourselves, in where we fit in this pecking order of of color? Uh, it's uh, it's very um, yeah sure. I mean I think um, you know this. Uh, Asian American scholar Claire Jean Kim uh, wrote a, a classic essay about it. And, you know, I guess we've always been in this kind of triangulated relationship, you know, where uh, between whites, uh, Asians, and whites, Asians, and um, Black Americans, where, um, you know, we are, Asians are uh, often used as a wedge, you know, and we're often used compared, we're often compared, uh, we're also often compared to be uh, to blacks as being the more black people as being the more favorable uh, um, minority, you know, but then when push comes to shove, you know, we're still not as good as uh, white Americans. I mean, when you talk about your family and um, I write a little bit about the LA riots, and that's 
that kind of parallels your family's experience where, uh, you know, in, in the book, I talk about how, um, you know, a lot of Koreans moved into South Central and opened up grocery stores. It was a food desert there. There were no grocery stores, no, uh, you know, very little retail and so forth because of of redlining, because um, um, Black uh, people throughout, as throughout history couldn't get the business loans, right, to open up their own stores. Meanwhile, during that time, um, their manufacturing dried manufacturing dried up um you know jobs left there was there were no jobs uh you know there was a lot of uh, uh real estate uh uh when during the great migration afterwards when black um people moved to la they were not allowed to live in the west side or any other parts and they were all kind of congested in south central so there was, you know, like all Chicago, for instance, there was urban neglect, you know, there was um, urban neglect. And then after 1965, which was the post seller, uh, post host, a uh, heart seller act, uh, that was when immigration was opened up to uh, um, the rest of the world, um, Asians and um, Latinos and Africans. Um, you know, that was when my family came. That was when um, Asian Americans from, um, uh, that was when Asian Americans really diversified in this country. And that was when Koreans came in and um, through uh, their own personal loan system called Key and through um, business loans, there were Koreans who opened up these stores, you know, and there was a lot of tension between um, tension between them and so forth. But then when the LA riots happened, um, a lot of the kind of scapegoating was pinioned on um, Korean, those Korean merchants who were, a lot of them were also working class. You know, a lot of them were also uh, trying to get by. And once, um, and also when the LA riots was happening, the police cordoned off Koreatown, South Central, and so forth, allowed everything to burn down. Meanwhile, they were protecting um, the west side of LA, the white side of LA. They were protecting Beverly Hills. They were protecting Sherman Oaks, all the white side. And meanwhile, they had, um, you know, uh, K Town, South Central, all, you know, downtown, that part where all, uh, you know, brown people, black people, Asians, they just allowed it they just let it burn down. So I think that kind of gives you an I sort of the complexities of um, sort of the different power dynamics of um, between Asians and black Americans and so forth. But I think it also depends. Let me just say this one more. But I think it also depends on the kind of um, Asian demographic you come from. There's a huge difference between, say, if you're like Chinese American or, or Korean American working at Silicon Valley um, and uh black people who lived in um you know east palo alto and um and then also uh or if you're Hmong and um and you come from your Hmong refugee living in the projects with uh, other black people in in minneapolis you know so it's just i also don't want to kind of um kind of collapse uh all different groups under this sort of triangulated relationship that I'm talking about. Yeah, it is, it is complicated and you always have to have those, you know, disclaimers and qualifiers, but it, but there are, I, I never thought of those parallels between, yeah, um, post-slavery South and then, you know, the grocery stores and the Asians playing the middleman and then and, and LA where the Asians again were playing the grocery middleman. I'd never thought of that. It's, it's fascinating, scary that, you know, that things would replicate themselves. And actually during the riots this summer in Chicago, um, there were a lot of Korean wig shops and phone stores um, on the South and West side that that also got damaged during the riots. And um, one of our reporters at BZ was looking at that. 
And I, I, I hadn't realized that I had done some stories about the Korean community, but I'd forgotten about all the commerce they had in, in those African-American neighborhoods. Um, well, switching gears a tiny bit, uh, there, there's, there is a lot to be you know, worried about um, in terms of Asian Americans and their interface with, with, with whiteness. But I wonder if there's something to be hopeful about in things like Squid Game, Parasite, uh, Michelle Wu, your book and its success with, you know, largely, well, not Michelle Wu, but Korean Americans bringing up in, in, in creative ways, these really compelling arguments about class and about capitalism, and we're eating it up. <laughs> what do you make of that? I don't know. I think it's, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I would uh, pair uh, what's happening, you know, what is it, like uh, what's happening in Korea with uh, what some Korean Americans are doing. I will say that there's a lot of really exciting Asian Americans writers who are coming out with books and have been coming out with books and they're getting more recognition um like uh C Pam Ju or uh you know or god now there's so many like Monica Sok who's a poet or Divya Victor I'm like I'm a poet so I'm going more towards poetry than fiction but it's it's really I think it's a it's a renaissance of Asian American writers um and it is exciting but and it is exciting to see how Americans have been responding to just um, um, Korea's soft, I guess they call it soft power, right? Like the skid game, the squid game and parasite and all of that. I think what, you know, I would, you know, I think what what's coming out of Korea has been um, going on for a while. And um, they've also been supported, subsidized by the Korean government, you know, because they know the importance of soft power. Um, I also think like, you know, there's some, you know, I'm, I'm writing about this right now, actually, in the way that um, I don't want to get too wonky about this, but the way that um, um, the Cold War and um, American neo-imperialism has affected Korea and other Asian countries. But, um, you know, I think that because it's such a small, Korea is such a small country, uh, South Korea is such a tiny country, and um, because it's so, um, it's become progressively more and more neoliberal since uh, the 1998 IMF crisis. Um, it's I I feel like it's like Korea is like a canary in a coal mine. So whatever repercussions from capitalism that Korea suffers it will happen in America five years later or 10 years later. So for instance, like in Korea, like this is a stupid example. Uh, Koreans were taking selfies, you know, like se seven years before they were, it was being, um, you know, Americans were taking selfies. But I think, um, you know, um, when um, there was more um, gig, the gig economy hit Korea really badly, uh, and uh, faster and earlier uh, there than it did in the States. And so I think there were a lot of movies and that were addressing that, you know, that inequality, that great inequality. And, um, you know, and now I guess America is catching on to that, you know, so it's exciting. I'm really proud to be a Korean American, right? I'm really proud to, uh, um, be a part of that, I guess. Although like the where the what's coming out in Asian America and what's coming out in Korea is I think has like sort of different origins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. I remember an editor in the 90s or maybe early 2000s came back from Seoul and he's like, they watch movies on their phones. You can't believe it. They're on the train and they can watch a movie on their phone. I think mm -hmm. America might be doing that at one point. And I was like, wow, you know, you're right. Like five years later, we actually had the ability to do it. Yeah. They, they are far ahead. Yeah, and I think it's exciting. And I think that like, I don't know. I'm, I tend to be an optimist. I think that, um, you know, of course, Asian Americans are such a disparate group, but at the same time, I, um, you know, one, one uh, note of hope that I saw was that 
um, you know, after the 2020 election, um, among 18 to 29 year olds, Asian Americans, they voted blue second to black Americans, 18 to 12, um, 18 to 29 year old uh, black Americans. So, you know, while there are certain groups like immigrants who are still staunchly Republican, there are also like the younger generation, like the younger generation in general, are leaning left they're they're turning and they're turning left and i think a lot of that has been inspired by of course climate change um you know uh but also black lives matter um and also uh our shit economy and all of that you know and i think there's there and i definitely have seen it from my students for a long long time you know uh, where they're just much more racially conscious very much more activists just like really fierce fierce uh generation of 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 folks you know my daughter actually interviewed a lot of asian americans who were talking to their parents about race and saying you know you know mm -hmm. it's really problematic the way you talk about race you know and then issues of anti-blackness but the the younger generation she saw was really trying to talk to the older generation about it and they mm -hmm. they 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 saw it as, as a major break from that generation. Um, we got a question uh, during registration. There are a ton right now, so I do not want to go over time um, uh, because I want you to be able to get to the questions that people are watching. But they asked, how can minor feelings be used as a catalyst for building power and community organizing? I don't know if that's up to me to answer. I think that's like, you know, I, I say this again, like, you know, I started as a poet and I'm still a poet and, um, you know, I'm not so much um, um, an organizer or, um, um, you know, <clears throat> or a social worker or a therapist and, and so forth. So I, you know, I'm a little bit, I'm not really quite sure how to answer that, but I will say that uh, from the responses that I've gotten about the book, which has been really incredible um and really humbling is that um i i have um you know people have started up a lot of book clubs uh um a lot of women especially um they turn to the book to read the book and i think um what i found really inspiring is how they really related to it personally um and what um readers have told me um, is that um, they were not only able to see through their alienation, they were not only they were able to see their alienation, but also see through their alienation and see how that alienation was actually structural, that it wasn't just them feeling that way, and they no longer felt alone. And um, I think that is a great step, right? First of all, to understand that um, your estrangement is not just you, that it's felt by others and that, and because of that, it's not your fault. It's something that's probably uh, societal or political. And from there, once you have that kind of recognition of your estrangement, can there be actually some uh, move towards uh, political organization and so forth? I have had, um, you know, I think what's also been really great to, is to have these sort of uh, multiracial kind of um, uh, uh, organizing where uh, people have read the book, also um, um, Black folks who've also read the book and have, um, have told me they've had a deeper understanding of what it's like to be Asian American. And that's been also really incredible. And so for for me, I think it's really, for me, I think it, what's been really productive and interesting is, it, you know, if coalition building is always really, really uncomfortable and difficult, but I think um, when you're building coalitions between races, between classes, between genders or whatever, it's um, it's always to get together, but um, but first have a reading list, you know, and um, read uh, as many history books or 
uh, memoirs or poetry or fiction before you start the discussion, you know, so you come armed, I mean, not armed, but you, you come with some knowledge and um, um, I think uh, someone who had a lot, a lot of experience with coalition building said that, and I would hope that maybe minor feelings could be in that reading list, you know, um, in, in that kind of before one enters a room and start talking, having that difficult conversation. For sure. Um, another uh, registry, register, registered person um, asks, any advice for Asian American kids struggling with identity? Um, I, you know, in terms of accepting their own identity? I think, I think that's what they meant. I, I wish I knew. Um, I would say that. Like, am I Asian? Am I American? What parts do I take? Who can I be? I would say that um, if you're feeling any kind of uh, confusion or self-loathing, you know, and say that um, it gets better and that, you know, um, if you're not finding that community right now in your high school or your junior high school, um, it's your community is out there in college or online and so forth, and you will um, and you'll find um, empowerment as you as you find those uh, find others. What what would you say? I think I need a, I need a more specific question. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I could uh, go to the person and, and ask kind of more specifically what they're looking for. It's kind of it's kind of broad, but I, I I don't think there is an answer. I think everyone is going to feel differently. Everyone is going to feel this Asian or that Asian or this American or that American in different situations, and you just have to explore and grow into it. <laughs> it's, Terribly imprecise. I, I think like um, it's a right now. I would say and this is me being hopeful again. Is a better. It's a. Um, I think it's an op more open environment to be uh, a racialized other than it was when I was growing up because the communities are there. I mean, even when. Um, uh, with my seven year old daughter, the kinds of Pixar movies that she's watching is completely different than, you know, the, the stuff that I watched. But, um, you know, I got a question like that before where someone asked me that their sister who's adopted is Korean and or um, and that she wanted nothing to do with Asian culture and um, she keeps trying to encourage her to listen to. I don't know, read Asian American books and so forth, and the and the and the she just refuses, and you can't force that on them. You just can't. You know, I think the more you try to force that on them, the more they're going to resist because teenagers are teenagers and they're going to like um, resist whatever their authority is going to say. But I, the resources are now there, and they're going to find it in their own time. You know, as long as maybe it's more you know, making sure to nurture their curiosity and nurture, um, um, you know, and also make sure that they're loved and cared for. And they'll find those resources, if not when they're a teenager, when they um, maybe a little bit later in their adult life, you know. Okay, um, we're just about at time and I'll give you a nice, easy, short question when we have one minute left. How do I support the Asian American community? I would say uh, uh, first of all, listen, um, understand, um, don't interrupt, read uh, as many books by Asian Americans as possible. Uh, I would, but I think beyond um, there is this also this kind of problem, and this is not just white people, I think this applies to all minorities where, um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of it is just, you know, when people say, how can I be an ally? It's more about like self-education more than anything else. And 
I think, you know, it starts with self-education, but it doesn't end with self-education. So yes, you go through the anti-racist uh, reading list, but then what else can you do from there? And I think it's like really important to support initiatives after you do that, support initiatives that help Asian American rights, whether it's like, uh, you know, uh, fighting against gentrification in Chinatown in your local city, or like, you know, or, or if you're in, trying to be there for, uh, you know, um, black, brown, working class kids and so forth to like, uh, you know, support your local s s schools and go to public, I mean, uh, um, um, public school instead of, you know, like um, funneling all your resources to a private school. I would say the same thing for being, uh, for Asian Americans, for supporting Asian Americans to uh, do the reading, um, do, you know, do your homework and understand and listen, but also just try to find ways to support initiatives, support groups, you know, um, uh, learn more about like undocumented Asian American, um, you know, workers, uh, you know, uh, let me one other example, the Atlanta massacre kind of uh, came and went, and there's been nothing about and you know no articles about like what you know the kind of invisible uh uh sex workers uh which make up a significant portion of asian americans and there's been no follow-up no feature follow-up there or there was maybe a couple um but you know uh support groups that you know help help uh you know these workers for instance you know if you for instance you feel sorry for what happened to um, uh, the Asian women who were massacred. Right, and on a sort of more concrete level, there are a lot of bystander trainings that are still available for those. Yeah. yeah. And those are really, really... Um, I, I I think like that was of... really, that was what was really kind of um, disturbing and unsettling was that in the beginning when there were these anti-Asian hate crimes or bias crimes and you, there were with, and it was um, filmed, there was no one, no one helping out, no one doing anything and it was really alienating and um, very lonely to see and I think there is like bystander training that you can do. Um, but I also have seen lots of um, heard about or read about lots of instances where people do are now standing up and helping and um, and all of that. For sure. Well, thank you so much. Now I'd like to turn it over to Sam who will uh, read some questions from the audience. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we were talking amongst some of the librarians that you give fantastic long answers, like at the drop of a hat. It's very impressive. Um, <laughs> and I do just want to share with the audience, um, we received between the questions that were submitted prior to the event and the ones that were submitted during the event, we've received over 40. So we are not going to be able to get to all of the questions. Um, but, and we'll share things like a few people put some book suggestions out, we'll, we'll do our best to share those when mm -hmm. we share the video. So um, a couple of things um, first, and again, um, Michelle Wu, I have been informed by um, some of my, my colleagues from the Barrington area that I must mention that she is a product of the Barrington school system. She went to um, elementary, middle and high school in the Barrington area before mm -hmm. she went to Harvard. So we are also very proud of her and very invested. Amazing. So, yeah, it's really fun. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a question that came up during your talk. Um, and I'm just going to read it in its entirety. So it's a little long. It says, you've explained the conflict of needing to prove yourself as a poet with regard to catering to a white audience or panel or system. Did you feel similarly when writing your book or has it been an entirely different experience? Are you sitting with any unexpected emotions in response to the deservedly widespread positive attention you have received for your book? And they close by saying, thank you for writing a book that makes people like me feel seen for the first time. Oh, thank you. That's so sweet. Um, the I'm sorry. The first, I can repeat. repeat it one more time. So yeah. the first part of the question was um, when you're writing poetry, needing to prove yourself, right? Mm -hmm. 
And did you feel the same way when writing the book or was it a different experience? No, it was a different experience because I think when, as a poet, you know, I was, you know, I, in the book, I wasn't thinking so much of an audience, of an audience as more as an institution or, or I was just thinking about posterity, like just like, because no one reads poetry. And I was writing, I write experimental poetry. So I'm like, well, maybe a hundred years from now, people will read my poetry and, you know, it'll be canonized or blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, but of course that institution is codified in whiteness, you know, or just sort of, uh, you know, um, um, in, in a highly academic sense. Uh, I, when I wrote um, Minor Feelings, I was re writing it, I had a completely different perspective on it. I was writing it, um, first of all, uh, for myself, for my daughter, when she was, it, for her to read when she was older. She, I was writing it for people like me who felt estranged and didn't have the vocabulary to talk about it or and so forth and by people like me i don't mean like other korean american women necessarily it's just other uh you know primarily other uh racialized groups that uh, uh have felt the same kind of minor feelings that i have had um so i was really kind of purposely not trying to write it you know i was actually kind of it gave me a certain amount of glee to give a middle finger to what white people were expecting, you know, the kind of Asian American narratives that white people were expecting. It gave me a certain kind of pleasure not to write in that way. Um, so, in, so I wasn't pandering and I was very lucky enough um, that, you know, sometimes of course you've heard, hear a lot of horror stories about how Asian Americans or other people, writers of color have white publishers who expect them to kind of water down their work and, um, and everything. And I was, uh, I was privileged to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, have, uh, an editor, a young editor who is um japanese american and then um the editor who took over um that was victory mitsui and the editor who took over was uh chris jackson who's a publisher of one world um who's black so i you know and their mission is always uh you know um their their um, their mission has always been publishing books that kind of upended or uh, uh you know kind of upended these dominant narratives that sort of um, these hegemonic narratives that sort of undermine racialized experiences. So I was in the right place for it. I was in the right family for it. And so I didn't feel like I was pandering that um, having said that I did because of that, I feared that no one was going to read it, you know, and I was sure of it and gave me a lot of anxiety to know that, that, you know, because, you know, I was writing about an invisible uh, race that it, the book itself was going to be invisible. Which is really that kind of leads into the second question that this this individual asked, which is, um, are you sitting with any unexpected emotions in in a response to the white I, positive? I don't tension? know. I I think it's sort of you know I'm still the neurotic uh, poet who feels like an underdog and feels that no one's gonna I mean it's like I've been I've been like you know it's I think it would be it would have been different if I had this kind of success when I was like 25 or something or 27 but you know I'm 45 um I you know and I have had a lot of rejections along the way so and I you know and so it's it's kind of strange that um it, it's happening and I also and also during the pandemic when there's been a lot of grief and anger and you know and just um you know unresolved just unresolved mourning you know and um for my book to take off like that during that time um certainly i feel both um elated and happy but also ambivalent and um but it makes me feel really good that um some people some readers have been able to uh rely on that book as to help them through this difficult time that that does make me feel really good. Um, I also hope that um, and expect that after this book, as there have been 
before this book, uh, that there'll be a lot more books who will kind of continue on or ex complicate or expand the conversation. Okay. Um, and that actually I was thinking that's kind of like almost analogous to the body dysmorphia that you talk about in the book. That <laughs> <laughs> it's been shaped this way for so long it's hard to see how much things have blossomed i have like manuscript dysmorphia like you know when i was <laughs> saying this to actually to my to my editor like i hate i was like i hate printing out my manuscript out because then when i see the cold print in the cold light of day i feel like it's just horrible no matter what you know so <laughs> if i've accepted it I, i've accepted it it just takes me a little while to get used to yeah so that would be um i'd be interested to hear you know you mentioned do the reading do the work are there book suggestions that you would offer to the audience oh um um about anything or related to i i think maybe anti-racism i mean learning more about the asian experience and then anti-racism i I'll, I'll say those two things i do not know that that is what if that is what the call the i was um the book a book that it was just um um shortlisted actually for the national book award that i've been championing um is uh, grayson Cho's tastes like war and um you know when people have been i mean people have been asking me this in the right relationship like how do i kind of uh process what's been happening on for the last year or two. And I think that book is just so gorgeous. It's about this uh, author's schizophrenic mother. She's half Korean and her mother's uh, uh, was schizophrenic. And she was, she found out that her mother was a prostitute when she was in Korea. And um, she married her father who was in the American, who was an American soldier, white American soldier in Korea and then they moved to Oregon, the rule of Oregon and they had her and it was just uh, just like really heartbreaking book. Um, and she had schizophrenia, you know, schizophrenia actually af affects um, immigrants uh, and especially immigrant women, I think like three times more, I could be wrong, three times more than other people because I think that disease is environmental. Um, so she writes about that and she writes about, um, um um sex work and she writes about just um well, how a lot of this kind of asian female fetishization sexualization is tied to um you know americans going uh on, you know american overseas adventures you know in the wars and the forever wars and and so forth and she writes about that all so beautifully so that's a book i would recommend i would recommend divya uh, victor's curb c-u-r-b these are more recent books uh, she's a um, South Asian poet, and um, it's just, I love it. It's just a beautiful book. And then also um, um, a, cla um, uh, no, a little bit older one is Jeff Chang's Can't Stop, Won't Stop. Uh, you know, I just, I just love his work. Um, and um, uh, Sien Nai, uh, Ugly Feelings, you know, which I'm a book that I'm very indebted to. So there's, those are some examples. Okay. Um, That's great. I'm writing as fast as I can to make sure we catch all of them. Mm -hmm. um, there is um, another question that came in from someone that I think it's a very specific situation, but speaks to a general challenge. Um, so I'll summarize the first part of this. Um, the questioner is Asian with a name that is distinctly Asian. Um, and they um, were at their child's school doing a check-in and they asked them to repeat their name and spell their name over and over and over again. And kind of said, what's going on? Why is this so hard for you? They said, oh, you know, we had an update to our system. Everybody's going through this. Don't, you know, don't take it personally. And, um, and she said, I have a hard time with that. I don't know how to verbalize why it's offensive. Many other incidents like this happen and I always question myself, am I supposed to be offended or am I overreacting? Which I feel is very typical for Asians. What advice do you have for someone like me that has a hard time labeling my feelings in situations like this? How do I fact check myself that this is indeed upsetting for me? Thank you for that question. I think it's a very, uh, yeah. uh, um, 
vulnerable question, a brave question to ask. I think that, uh, you know, I mean, this is what I try to kind of articulate in the book is that um, um, I think it's uh, this is a, this is the way it is for all um, all groups, uh, you know, marginalized groups. But it, it is kind of in an insidious way for Asian Americans, where we are sort of conditioned to minimize uh, and minimize whatever um, um, insults or slights or uh, actual uh, macro aggressions that we endure, and we're supposed to not um, say that think that it's just in our head and it's not actually really. Uh, happening and I think that if your body feels it you know that it's true you know you're not if you're not making it up you know it's like that so um so believe in yourself when you know that um you are being aggressed against or someone is insulting you or offending you in some way and i think for uh one of my few i have very few regrets in my life but one of the few regrets that i do have is that like you know when you're a young asian woman um you get you deal with a lot of people's bullshit, you know and you just take it in and you take it in and you think you're not you always feel like you're not allowed to kind of um um you know um sling back at it or you know or just uh boomer, boomerang back um um and say that i'm not going to take your bullshit and uh, one thing that's been very gratifying and um that i don't even think about anymore is i i don't take people's bullshit anymore and that i just i i'm just very firm and direct and i just put people in their place. And I was do and I did this before minor feelings came out or anything like that, you know, and I think that if you feel it and you believe it, you don't doubt yourself. Don't um just don't doubt yourself. Don't second guess yourself. Be firm, be direct. You're uh, a future you will thank you for it. Yeah. And, and your children, right? Yeah. So you and your children. And I, yeah, um, I a little bit of me wanted to um, tweak the last question. You know, how do I fact check myself that this is indeed upsetting? Like it's upsetting. You, there's no fact check necessary. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I understand the the sense that they were trying to get at. So, um, let's see. Um, this is one that came in prior to the conversation. Um, you mentioned the book that Richard Pryor is an inspiration to you. Are there other authors, artists, performers that inspire you? And I have an adjunct to that as well. Once you, once you're done. Um, uh, um, Richard performers and artists. I mean, I love. They say authors, artists, performers. Oh, I mean, I could just rattle off more authors and artists. I love. Um, Oh my God, where do I even start? Um, Fred Moten uh, is someone who I love. Uh, his books, Black and Blur, Under Commons. Um, I love Sadia Hartman. Uh, um, Wayward Lives is the book that I would recommend. Performers, I love Ali Wong, um, Bo and Yang. You know, in terms of comedians, I've I was I, there was a period when I got really into comedy, stand up comedy. This is like before, you know, uh, around the time that I got really got into Richard Pryor, and then I, you know, I have these obsessions, and then unfortunately, once I write about my obsession, I sort of move on from it. So I haven't really been watching it as much stand up comedy i think stand up comedy has taken a bit of a hit since uh, the david dave chappelle special but um but i still you know i still love it and, um and i'm a big fan of ali wong um uh artists ruth uh carol walker ruth asawa there's so many like i just feel i feel like i should have just write down a list of names and just like put like just copy it onto the chat box so you're not furiously scribbling or I'm not, I'm not like, you know, just uh, grasping for names when there's so many that I feel like I, sh I should say. Yeah, but those are just a few. Yeah. Okay. Well, and interestingly, the adjunct to that question that was asked by a different questioner, but felt like they kind of went together to me was 
Um, thank you for your illuminating, unexpected, and moving chapter on stand-up comedy. If you've seen Dave Chappelle's show, would you share your insights about his work? I didn't watch it. Okay. Sorry. I, yeah. I, That's, I can't, okay. I'm like, I don't, I don't need to, uh, I just, mm -hmm. I, so I, I can't comment and I think I can't say anything that has been already been um, written by um, actually a lot by a lot of black queer writers, black uh, uh, queer folks who just really rightly nailed Dave Chappelle uh, for his um, um, uh, just deep, deep homophobia. Um, uh, you know, I think he also made a crack against Asians or, you know, about being COVID and I can't, but I haven't watched it. And I just, you know, I just yeah, I comment on it, you know, mm -hmm. just read. <laughs> I would yeah. just say, listen to the people who already have and seen it. Uh, it was that, yeah. And I think that's fair. And it's, you know, especially during COVID, it's a, it's a way of taking care of yourself to sometimes not take in all the media that's available. Yeah. Um, so again, let me, I think this will be the last question that I will ask you here. And as I said, I think I did four, which means there's 30 some that we didn't get to. And I'm sorry, mm -hmm. um, but, but we can't keep Kathy on the phone. It's an hour later where she is. So, um, and this is, you are a college professor. You mentioned in the book, seeing that um, the students in your classes are doing better at talking about race. Um, if you were teaching younger people, elementary, middle, high school, how would you approach discussions of race and identity with, with various age groups? I don't know. Oh my God. I, you know, I think that that's uh, uh, there. I, I just, I think elementary school teachers, middle school teachers, and high school teachers have some of the hardest jobs and they have like a whole skill set that I lack teaching college. And in fact, I would say my job is easier being a college professor because I just, first of all, I don't have to deal with parents and as much. And then second of all, like, I feel freer to teach whatever I want. I will say that I am. I find this sort of trumped up uh, 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 critical race theory scam to be really quite frightening. And um, you know, when it was when it popped up, when it was happening earlier this year, I just refused to kind of engage with it because it was just it seemed so ridiculous as ridiculous as QAnon. But now it does seem like it's just like QAnon, it's spreading, you know, and that this is like the latest iterations of, of the GOP, uh, of the GOP using white racial anxiety to kind of get um, Republicans to vote against their own, or not just white, it's not just white, by the way, it's also other people of color as well, uh, to vote against their own economic interests and vote for, um, uh, you know, vote for them, you know, by drumming up all this uh, racial anxiety and fear. And for that reason, I think, you know, we need to double down, you know, and I think as college professors, professors and um, uh, elementary school and middle school and so forth, I, I would say, I don't know. I, I don't really know what is considered sort of age appropriate for the books uh, to have these kind of um, to have a multicultural curriculum. All that. All I know is that I'll just say this, maybe because I haven't taught schools, I will say how I felt when I was a student. Um, when I was in middle school and high school, I did not read a single Asian American uh, poet or writer. I read one Toni Morrison book, and for that I was grateful. Um, the bluest eye. Um, but other than that, I had I never read a, a, a single person of color, which is why I never felt like I had a permission to be a writer. And in the history books, it still affects me how um, there was not a, even a paragraph on Asian American history on the trans um, on the um 
you know, Japanese internment camp, maybe it was me mentioned in a couple sentences or, uh, you know, or uh, the first Chinese immigrants who came here, or nothing about the Chinese Exclusion Act, none of that. And, um, and also the Korean War, all that was said about the Korean War was that um, Americans were fighting communism and they, you know, basically they were the white saviors who saved Korea and neglected to mention that um, 3 million people died in Korea. And I think it would have really, you know, and this may be considered negative or not empowering or whatever, but if I knew that, I think that would have really kind of strengthened my sense of self and strengthen um, my own sort of critical knowledge of this country and who I am and so forth. So I think that, I don't know when it's good, but I don't think it's just important to teach like the empowering, like, yay, I am Asian and I am a powerful woman, but also the truth of American history, mm -hmm. that that can be empowering, not just for uh, uh, students of color, but for white students as well to kind of not, uh, placate them or pander to them and really kind of show them how to really think about um, the different histories, uh, American histories. Yeah. Um, someone commented in chat, the TEACH Act was just passed in Illinois to make sure these stories and histories are included in the curriculum. And actually, I know um, there is a librarian, school librarian on that panel as well. So um, the, Great. yeah, which is very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so we will, it is a few, it's 10 minutes after eight. So we will begin to wrap up. Um, you, the audience will see that um, Roz just put a poll up. So if I could ask the folks who are here to answer that. Um, Monica, you had a couple people who commented that it was really nice to finally see what you look like after reading your writing and hearing you on radio so, so for so long. Um, I'm deeply grateful, I will say personally, um, I was trying to be restrained about it and I still highlighted 63 things in your book. <laughs> I went through and counted today. I'm like, yeah, that's what I thought. So mm -hmm. it was amazing writing. We appreciate it so, so very much. Um, and I have to give a thank you to the other libraries who um, worked with us and in particular to Roz from Vernon Hills and Beth Keller from Highland Park, who managed kind of the technical side of the Zoom. So thank you very, very much for being with us. We really appreciate your time and your authenticity and your willingness to share. It meant a great deal. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great Thanks, day. everyone. Have a good night.